Heavenly Father, I come before you today, O oh Lord. I come before you as a humble servant, Almighty God. Father God, I surrender this service into your hands, Almighty God. Father God, I thank you for everybody that who is joining in to hear your word, Almighty God, this morning. Father God, you are the Alpha and the Omega, O oh Father. You are Jehovah Jireh, Almighty God. Father God, you waked us up this morning, Almighty God. You give us the breath of life this morning, Almighty God. Father, you saved us from the enemy, Almighty God. Father God, I give you the praise and the honor and the glory that you deserve, Almighty God. Father God, I give you the love that you deserve, Almighty God. Father God, I just want to thank you for sending your Son, Almighty God, your only Son, to die for our sins, Almighty God. In Jesus' almighty name I pray, Almighty God. Amen. If you are hearing me loud and clear, just shout out on the chat, loud and clear. Just want to say, I am humbled to be here to share the word for Jesus Christ this morning. And there's a, I mean, you all have, you, everybody have their small testimonies that took place this week. And I just want to take this opportunity to let everyone know that I have so much of testimonies within this short period of time from last week Sunday to now. So much. And the most recent one is that there was a, where I live in my home, there was an intruder yesterday. Or the day before yesterday, there was a six inch centipede that just came into my son's room and just stood a couple inches from my son's feet. And I was nowhere there. I was in the other bedroom. His mother was in the living room. And he was able to saw. Now, little children, he was on his computer. Little children, they would not take their eyes off of that computer. And he was able to see that centipede and come and alert us. And that centipede picked the wrong home to come into that day because we mashed him up. And I just want to show you another side of the story. It could have been, things could have turned out different. The centipede could have bitten any one of us. And, but God ensured that centipede was revealed because I came in the room, I didn't see the centipede on, on approaching inside the room. And that centipede just walked out and just revealed himself. And it wasn't that centipede, is, it, is God just revealed that centipede to me? It had, Nathaniel had his, um, my son, he had his cricket bat there and I squashed his head one time and that is the day. So I tell you, the devil is a liar. That centipede take the wrong home to come in that day. And things could have turned out different. And it may sound funny, but to go in the hospital around this time, it's easy. And I can tell you that for sure. With this COVID situation and stuff. And I, it's a good thing I was home because I wasn't supposed to be home that day also. And if I wasn't home, well, my wife, property Sherry Ann, she said she don't know what she'd have done. But there's another sermon there. She said that, so I, I, I was asking her, I say, well, why, why you could not just kill it? She said, nah, she's she, she not doing that. I say, what, well, something, that, that, that is fear. She said, no. It's that she can't handle the, the grossness of squashing it. I say, well, okay. So, but there's another story. I just want to start off on a light note this morning that God is good. And there's so much things that God did in my life this week and weeks before and months before and years before. And it's always good to have recent testimonies. Yes, it is important for us to have testimonies all the time and reflect on the testimonies that brought, brought us to who we are today. But it's always to have good, good recent testimonies. I have so much I have seen where God has provided in my life where I didn't have anything. And God just revealed and just put things on my, in my cupboard, put things in my refrigerator, put diesel in my tank, put everything that I need. And it may not seem that the cupboard's always full or anything, but as soon as something finished, he topped it up at that same day he finished. So sometimes you may be looking at the full cupboard or the full refrigerator and 
We just wanted it to, just wanted to be full to expire and use it. God puts us in a situation where we, at that point where we run out and we really need it, that is when he tops up our resources. And the thing is, I was able to witness all these supernatural things in my life. Not by my strength, not by my, my understanding, but from faith in God and faith in that he provides. You know? So I just want to give God the thanks and the praise and the honor that he deserves for the blessings, the little blessings that we take for granted. Even getting two green traffic lights going down the road. Sometimes you're going down the road and you're only meeting red light. Even the red light too is a blessing. The red light could be preventing you from getting into an accident. The green light can be preventing you from getting into an accident. So anytime stop light or go light, green light, give God thanks and praise. Because you don't know what lays ahead and what he's protecting you from. Sometimes God maybe keep a job away from you. Sometimes he deny you a job. Not because you, within your understanding, that is a job for you. Sometimes God keeping you from that job for a certain reason. I remember when, and this is something I want to share, years ago when I just left school, I started, my first job was working at KFC. KFC in Gulf City there, Gulf View on the hill. And I used to go, go class, attend classes in the evening. And doing all these courses, doing this, doing that, doing that. And I was one after I'd done all these courses and job after job where you have to be working all hours, working for small money, you know. And you're, you, you're thinking to yourself that you want to, you want to get something better. And I always wanted to work in the local oil refinery. It was my, that was one of my dream jobs. And, and I applied, I applied this, this refinery, I applied this place, these big name companies, and I never get through. I felt so rejected at that point in my life. I remember that at some points I used to feel like, why, why God doing this to me? What, what I really doing? I doing these things, I making these sacrifices. And I never got through with that job. And look what happened today. That, that company is no more. And he gave me a better job. And he even gave me a better job on top of that. He revealed to me that my purpose and my main job is supposed to be spreading the gospel. So sometimes you may think that God not blessing us. God not doing anything for us. But sometimes the, the good things that we may see in our eyes, he's keeping away from us. Sometimes that he's actually keeping, out, keeping us away from bad things. So I just want to give God the praise and the honor and the thanks for all that he has done in my life. And I'm sure everybody has some sort of story like that, unknowingly and knowingly to you. And if it is you have a little testimony or something, I just want you to type amen, what God has done for you in the chat. Let's say, he delivered me from this. He kept me from this. Something. Let's type it in the chat. Let others know that Jesus is God and he is the one that keeps us and ensures that we go the right path and we don't deviate from anything else. And we just want to stress on the team this morning. The team this morning is Exhibit G. The team for this month is ex Exhibit G. And from a philosophical standpoint, we want to be able to acknowledge and let you all know and ensure that you all know that who is Jesus. Who is Jesus? Who to you, who do you think is Jesus? Is he a 
character from Disney. Some people think that. Is he a myth? Is he a legend? Who is he? So, we read about Jesus in the Bible. We read the four Gospels. And when I was growing up, I didn't know who was Jesus. And it has certain times I went through my life where I didn't know love. I felt rejected. I felt rejected for my job. I felt rejected for my family. I felt rejected in school. I felt rejected amongst my peers. And when I came to New Christ, and I came to have a relationship with Christ, Anybody who reject me, I know that he will never reject me. He will never throw me away. He will never ignore me. So when we see, and I was always a happy person. If anybody knew me, I was smiling. And back then, I used to always be smiling, but I hurting inside. And I have so much of regrets, so much of hurt, so much of pain. So much things I witnessed in my life. I remember it was about three years ago. I the Lord just lay on my spirit to go and find out about my biological father. Just inquire of him. Now my story my story is that my biological father never I never knew him. I only met him once in my life when I was small. And I grew up with my mother and my stepfather. My stepfather took me in, even before I was born. And I never knew my real father. I never had a relationship with him. And growing up, when I became a teenager, I always felt that rejection deep down inside. Deep down, so far deep down inside that I never even acknowledged it to myself. But I felt that rejection. And I met with my father three years ago. He was on his deathbed. And I wouldn't even call it a bed. He was, on his, he was in my grandmother's house on a mattress. The house was dilapidated. No windows, no running water, no electricity. And I saw, when I look at him, he was all frail and skinny and... I actually saw what the devil wanted to do to me in my life. I saw what Jesus delivered me from. I saw the curses that were broken in my life. I saw what hole, what gutter, what pit he pulled me out from. Because I could have been the same way if God didn't pull me out. Because even though I was a good boy, even though I was looking as though I was a good boy, my heart was nasty. My heart was dirty. My heart was filthy inside. I had so much of hate. I had so much of anger. I had so much of painful memories, painful thoughts. I remember growing up as a young boy, five, six, seven years old. Even probably till about when I was about 16, I witnessed my mother and my stepfather. I would be sleeping in the night, and I would hear dishes breaking, doors slamming, my mother yelling, my father cursing at my mother. Sometimes my mother would have been working. She worked KFC also. She would came, come home in the night, and two of us would have to escape the house from danger and go and look for somewhere to hide, go and hide by a neighbor. And I grew up with this on a regular basis. This was the scene in my childhood on a regular basis. And to this day, I understand what is to do to forgive. I forgive my stepfather because I come to the realization that it wasn't his fault. The enemy had him in his hands. And 
he did not know Christ. He did not have a relationship with Christ. And this kind of exposure I got from as a child, it affected me a lot. It affected me so much that when I was going to school, I had no self-confidence. I had so much of fear. I was afraid to talk to people. And I used to be the class clung just to camouflage my hurt and my pain. Because sometimes in life I realize as people we have so much of hurt, we have so much of pain, we go into that cave of where we give out some kind of attitude. We give out some kind of something that is not of God, some kind of stupidity to camouflage the pain that we have deep down inside. And I just want to tell you, tell you today, I don't know what, I don't know who you are. I don't know who, who hurt you. I don't know what pain you have witnessed in your life. I don't know what sins you have committed in, my, in your life. I just want to know that Jesus loves you. Jesus cares for you. Jesus will always remember you. And it's never too late to come out of that cave and surrender your life to him. Repent of your sins and surrender your life unto him. Because let me tell you something. I didn't know Jesus. I always thought Jesus as a character. I never believed in the Bible. And when I actually read the Bible and I researched the Bible, now, I didn't grow up in a Christian household. I never knew about Christianity. I grew up in a Hindu village. And my parents never knew any kind of belief. So the closest thing for me to go was somebody's Hindu ritual or Hindu prayers or something like that. I went to a Hindu school. So that is all I knew growing up. And I never felt anything. I never, how it is, I grew up in a village that is a Hindu village. They claim to know religion. They worship in their idols. And how it is, I experienced in all of this. I went to a Hindu school praying how much time a day. How it is I experience in this? How it is my father still beating my mother? How it is my father is still being an alcoholic? How it is my biological father is still a drug addict? How it is I have to be running, running from home every night? How it is I have to be getting put out as a child and getting pulled out of my bed in the middle of the night to go and hide somewhere? How it is I could have never experienced any good thing from God. So, when I came to New Christ and I surrendered my life, I, I was baptized in 2009. And I realized, even then when I was baptized, I didn't, still didn't know Christ. I still didn't have a relationship with Him. Why? Because Christianity to me was aesthetically pleasing is to look good on the outside. People dress up, looking nice and clean. They're not doing any simidimi. Everybody looking happy. You do good. You say good morning. Hallelujah now and then. Amen now and then. And that is it. I still know, did not know Christ. And even then, I used to feel rejected. And... The thing is, the, my problem was sin. And not the outward sin, the sin that people could see. I am talking about the sin that, is in, that was in my heart. Even though I used to curse, even though I used to drink, even though I used to do all kind of nonsense, my heart was more, what it, what, even though I was moving with the crowd, my heart was a million times filthy than what you would see on the outward. And I just want to thank God for healing my heart and helping me 
clean up my heart. Because that is the problem today, you know. The problem today is man's heart. The problem today is man's sin. How do we solve that problem? We see around the world. We see even in this country where sin is glorified. Sin is like drinking a cup of water. We see young girls exposing their bodies on social media. We see men partaking in substances and being slaved to drugs, being slaved to alcohol. And yet it seems to be glorified in this world. We see in men, we see in something that is being welcomed in society where lust over a woman's body is welcomed. Why? You see, even though you not physically going with a woman and having intercourse with her, but the fact that you're thinking it, the Bible said that is a sin because it comes from your heart. Every action that you do, it comes from your heart. So even though you think and somebody may think that you didn't hate this person, but at the end of the day you think in it, and you hate in this person, and you already killed him in your heart. So that is a sin by itself. Some of us like to idolize our opinions. So we, we, have, we want to have nothing to do with the Bible. We don't want to have anything to do with it. But we idolize in our own opinions. And we, see, we are perceiving that our opinions are right and is the right way of life. But I am here to tell you today, your opinions and the opinions that you idolize are not of God. The true word of God and the true understanding about life comes from this book, the Bible. And you may ask me, why do I believe in the Bible? Yes, it's the living word of God. Yes, it pierces our hearts, the words. Because when we read the Bible and we read the Gospels and we read the New Testament and the Old Testament, we kind of go back in that cave because we realize this not lining up with our life. This not lining up with the things I like to do. This not lining up with the beer I like to drink. This not lining up with the woman I like to lust over. This not lining, lining up with the, the brother and sister I like to hate. It's not lining up with that. So we tend to reject it. And the Bible talks about Jesus was rejected by his own people. And this is where I want to go in the word. And I just want to, from an outside point of view, from an outside of Christian point of view, why do I read the Bible? The four Gospels is not just stories, it's not just fictional characters. It is not just a play or a theatre production that somebody put together. The four Gospels of Jesus Christ is physical eyewitness detail from all perspectives from a four-dimensional perspective on what Christ did for us, what God did for us, the fact that he died for our sins. And we, it is not only backed up by Christians, it is not only backed up by the Old Testament, it is also backed up by historical documents. So, when you think and you, would, you, you, you believe that a, this book was just written by man, yes, it was written by man, but it was inspired by God, and it was the eyewitness account of Jesus' death and resurrection and what he did for us. Because this is the cure to our sin. This is the cure to all the things that we like to do and we think is right. The Bible. And Jesus Christ 
in the Bible shows that He is God. He is omniscient. He is omnipotent. He is omnipresent. And I just want to let you know that if you don't want to believe in the Bible and you say this Bible is just written by man, just think about it. Think about this. Why would God write? Why would God inspire man to write a cure? Why would God do that? Because of love. Because he loved us. Because not only he created us and he leave us there. He loved us because he understood that our sin, our sin would lead us to death. Our sin would lead us to eternal damnation. He does not want that for us. So the sin that we are committing here, the sin that we are committing in this life, there is a cure for that sin. There is a cure, and he sent the cure to die for us on the cross. And I would go, I hope you all have your Bible this morning, because I want, when I reflect on the word, and I share the word, that everyone see what I'm talking about. Because the Bible, Jesus spoke about this in John chapter 4, where he is living water. The water that we drink in every day, the blue waters and the oasis and the pipe-borne water supply, the rainwater, care quench our thirst, like the water that Jesus gives to us. And I just want to go to John chapter 4, where Jesus is speaking to the Sumerian woman. And just to give you a perspective on what's going on here, Jesus is speaking to the Sumerian woman. This is different. This is something that was not done back in those times. Why? Sumeria was not liked by the Jews. Why? Because they had their own belief and they mixed with the Gentiles. And this is where the Sumerian civilization came from. And this, he met with this woman in a town of Saika. And the thing is, normally, this would have been the route if you want to go from Judea to Galilee. You would pass through Samaria to go. But Jews would have tend to take another direction, just not to pass through the town. Because they rejected the town. They rejected the people. They didn't want to have anything to do with the people. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt rejected? Have you ever felt in a way that nobody wanted to be next to you? Nobody wanted to have anything to do with you? The fact that Jesus is talking to this woman alone was testament to his love. And Jesus asked the woman for some water. He said, Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Now the woman was like, how it is you, a Jew, is asking me for a drink of water? Normally, you Jews will not have, want to have anything to do with us. And let me tell you something about this woman. Normally, people would go to Jacob as well in this, in this town here, in, either in the morning or either in the afternoon, in the evening, to get away from the heat of the sun. This woman went in the middle of the day. Why? Because this woman was also rejected by her own society. So you see a woman that was facing double rejected, rejected by these Jews and rejected by her own people. Because she was a woman that had many husbands. She used to go with people's husband. You understand? So she was a, how we would call it, a homewrecker. And 
the fact that Jesus chose this woman to talk to shows me that his love, his love that he had for people, and not only, most importantly, people who were rejected. People who were rejected by society, people who were rejected by their own family. So, and I show because I felt that way at one point in time. I felt rejected by society. I felt rejected by my own family. And it's not a nice feeling. I remember when I used to go to school, I used to feel so rejected because nobody liked me. Nobody liked how I looked because when I was going to school, I had so much acne. I was skinny. I was, didn't have the best clothes because I didn't come from the best financial background. So I used to look a certain way. I used to talk a certain way. I used to be a certain way because of the fact that the household I came from, you know? So people used to just reject me and want to have anything to do. I, didn't have, I did not have any friends in school. I did not have any clip or group I used to line with or talk with. I was always by myself. And I will talk to this person there, I will talk to that person there, you know. So, and I'll just be the class clown just to fit in. And similar to this woman, she was facing double rejection. Rejection by the Jews and rejection by her own people in Samaria. And I want to read the verse from John chapter 4, verses 7. To verses 11. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How it is that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me? a woman of Samaria. For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The question Jesus asked this woman is, Give me a drink. He is asking this woman for something. Has Jesus ever asked you for something? Has Jesus ever asked you for your heart? Has Jesus ever asked you? I just want, to, I just want you to ask yourself that question. The fact that the matter is, Jesus asks for something. And this woman eventually give it, to, give it to him. She gave him a drink of water. But when he explained what living water is, and he explained that if you only knew who I was, you would have asked me for living water. The thing is, in order to receive that living water, that water that can quench our thirst for eternity, that water where we will never go thirsty again. We have to answer the call of Christ. We have to give him that drink of water that he wants from us. He wants us. He wants you to accept him as your Lord and Savior, to destroy that thing that's the, that is damaging and killing and devastating the world today and save you from that. He's asking you to repent. He's asking you to surrender your soul to him and acknowledge him as your Lord and Savior. So I just want you to take a little time and just ponder about that. Ponder about, has Jesus ever asked you for a cup of water? Yes, the well may be deep because it says here in the Bible, in the same chapter, that the well was deep. So even though the well may say deep and it's looking hard and you have questions. 
Just give the man the water now, please. Give him your soul. Accept him as your Lord and Savior. And you will see that living water that will enter your life. I just want to implore you that I not only speak in this because I read it, you know. I not only speak in this because I like how the Bible does look, you know. I not only speak in this because Christianity does look good, you know. I not only speak in this because I receive blessing in my life, you know. I am speaking this because I am a testimony to me standing here. Me standing here is a testimony to this living water. Me standing here alive with two eyes to see and nose to smell, our ears to hear, and two feet to walk on is a testimony of this living water. Because let me tell you something. I grew up around a belief that I never saw love. I never saw miracles. I never saw deliverance. All I saw was idol worshipping, picking flowers in the morning, putting it by something, throwing it, throwing it water on something, feeding milk to something, and it never worked. I never felt love. I never had a relationship. I cannot have a relationship but that, that is something that is made by man. I have to have a relationship with something that is the creator. I cannot have a relationship that's something that can be carried by a van tree. I cannot be in a relationship with something that I have to feed milk and water and flowers. I cannot be in a relationship with something like that. No. I have to be carried. I cannot be carried. I cannot carry something. So, I am a testimony to that. I am here because of Jesus Christ. And you may wonder then what, how Jesus Christ dying could help me. Because you know why? Because he endured that humiliation. He endured that pain. He endured that suffering. Because when I look at the scripture and I look at the gospels, and I start to analyze, and I'm, go, and I, I'm attending Dunamis Theological Seminary right now, and I have learned a lot about the gospels, and I learned a lot about my belief, and learned a lot about my relationship. Because it's good to have a relationship because at the end of the day, we were here to spread the gospel. So in order for me to spread the gospel effectively, I have to know what I'm talking about. I have to have an understanding, an in-depth understanding of what I'm talking about. And I am here to tell you that I still won't understand everything, but I understand enough to know that Jesus is my Savior. And I just want to let you know that I saw a, was a video, and it was the basic, the science and the biological point of view on how Jesus was crucified. I'm talking about the pain that he endured. I am talking about the suffering that he endured, the humiliation that he endured. And this is something that is important. We have to know what Jesus went through. So we would know why he did it. Because he didn't went through this for himself. He went through all of this for us. To save us. To give us eternal life. Jesus normally was an early riser in the morning. He would rise early and pray. So when they, were, when they seized him in the garden of Gethsemane. And... He was already up for so long. They said that for the time of his death till the time he woke up, it was 36 hours. He walked four kilometers to go, in by, to go by the Pontius Pilate uh, with the Pharisees for judgment on 
his crucifixion and stuff like that. He walked about one kilometer with a cross that weighed more than a hundred pounds, close to 200 pounds. He, in the garden, garden of Gethsemane, he was bleeding from his sweat. So when I looked at this, I said, how is this possible? Each one of your sweat glands has a capillary. His sweat glands, the capillary in his, his sweat glands ruptured. And that is something called hematidrosis. So it's something that is scientifically proven. That is something that happens to a human body when under stress. And they beat him. He suffered contusions. He was scourged. Scourging was being whipped by a strong Roman legionnaire. He was whipped about 39 times. They say that each blow of that whip, he would have needed 100 stitches for each blow. His muscle tissues in his back would have been ripped and exposed. They would have done that so that when the person is hanged on the cross, the birds and the ravens would pick on the muscles and to, to, to eat from his back. Now, Jesus was crucified by a civilization that was highly trained, and they were highly trained in the art of torture. So they knew how to torture somebody without killing them. They knew how to do that. So, this is something that they were accustomed to. The whip that they whipped him with had lead ends to dig into his skin. And he would have suffered all kind of damages to his back, to his face, to his, to his neck, everything. The most gruesome torture that is known to mankind today. And even then, after that, he had to carry the cross for that distance, a kilometer, to Golgotha where he would be crucified. When they crucified him now, when they were hanging him on the cross, they would have nailed nails on his feet and his hands to, to hang him. And what amazed me is that this, you know, you would think the, when you look at people who have cross, because I had a cross when I, before I knew Christ. I had a, on my vehicle, I had a, a rosary hung up on the rear view mirror, and I think I was a Christian. I had Psalms 23 written on the back windscreen and the front windscreen, and I feel I reach. I get through, I, I good. And when I do look at the cross, nowadays how they portray the cross, and you would see these different churches, they would have cross. The cross wasn't something that was pretty, you know. The cross is something, the wood that was used wasn't wood that was properly well plain for the comfort of the user, and it wasn't, it was something that had sharp edges. It wasn't, it was hard. It was something that when your when skin made contact with it, it would have scraped, scraped up your skin. So imagine Jesus hanging from this cross, his flesh in, the, in his back and his muscle exposed. And his back had to be, when, anytime his, he was breathing, because to exhale, he would have to push up. And he would have, have to be constantly being pushing up to speak. And to breathe. And that is why it is important to know what Jesus spoke while on the cross. When Jesus was hanged with two other, two other um, prisoners, two thieves. And two of the thieves were, one was willing to accept him, one was willing to to basically acknowledge him as Lord and Savior. And the thing is, Jesus spoke to one of them. Jesus said, if it is, you accept me as your Lord and Savior, you will join me in paradise. This was one thing. The other thing he said was, Father, forgive them, for they 
know not what, have, what they have done. He pleaded for our forgiveness while he was suffering so much pain. Think about it. In order for him to speak those words, he would have had to push up against the nails that were attaching him to the cross. He would have to push his bare back on that cross, that rough cross, feel so much of pain just to ask for our forgiveness. He spoke to the prisoner which he didn't have to speak to. He was totally coherent. Eh? He was totally sane. Because normally, when you go through all of this kind of thing, you would be in a different place. You would be, because they offered him wine and myrrh. He rejected it. Because you know why? Wine and myrrh was a sed sedative that would have numbed his body. So he would not have been able to feel the pain. But no, he rejected that because he was supposed to feel that pain and that suffering for us. Every ounce and every pint of pain that had to be witnessed, he had to feel it. And then he surrendered. No, I never knew this. I never knew that. I always thought that Jesus died from hanging from the cross. He died from the blood loss, from the scourging. But you have to understand something. Even though he lost blood, he would not have lost that much because at that time, he would have been cold because he was naked. And his sweat glands, his pores would have been closed in. So he would not have lost so much of blood. Because you know when you're cold, your blood moves away from your, your, your surface of your skin on the, on the inside. And the thing is, Jesus willingly surrendered his life for us. He, was, he had authority over giving up his life to us. He didn't Man was not in control, even though what they did to him, they were not in control of what the outcome was. He willingly yielded his life for us. All the sin that we committed, the, the, the big sin we think we commit, the small sin, okay, that's not big sin and small, sin is sin. He drank that cup. He suffered that pain. He experienced he, may, he experienced so much a thing. He experienced that humiliation that we do to him every day. Every day that we sin, we humiliate Christ. Every day that we hate our brother, we humiliate him. Every day that we reject somebody, every day that we lust, every day that we think about teeth and something, Every day that we think that our opinions are right, we deny Christ, we humiliate Him. And the thing is, He willingly, He knew all of that. He knew all of that would have, would have been taking place. He willingly gave His life for us. I just want to ask you today, if it is you want to come out of this sin, because sin is a problem in the world today, Sin is what is causing our children and our children's children and our father and our father's fathers to do the things that we, they, they have done. We see so much of pain going through the world today. We see people are dying. We see this COVID-19 situation where people are dying. All this that we are experiencing is God's judgment on our land. And this is something we have to know. And in order for us to keep afloat in this thing, because I understand that things may seem as though it's going to, think it's going to get better. They're coming out with the vaccine. They, they're putting measures in place sanitizing we have in on our mass. But when we come out of that thing and we go back to our normal life and we go back to 
live in? Are we going to do the same thing that we was doing before? Are we going to humiliate Christ? Are we going to countless of times do the wrong thing over and over and over again? Are we going to go back worshiping idols? Are we going to go back by the Obia man? Are we going to go back drinking? Are we going to go back smoking weed? Are we going back to drugs? Are we going, going back to drinking and liming? Are we going back to beating our wife? Are we going back to humiliating our wife and humiliating our husband and humiliating our children? Are we going back to humiliating Christ? Think about it. Because all this, we can be delivered from all this. Come back good, everything back to normal, the world back to normal. We could go and visit the places of the world. We could go back to our job. We could go back working, taking care of our families. But are we going to change? Are we going to change our heart? Are we going to clean up our, our hearts? Because let me tell you something, my heart had to go through a serious cleaning. Because even though I was looking happy and I was saying good morning and good evening and good night and how you're going and doing the good things and not doing this and not doing that, not drinking, not smoking, taking care of my family, but my heart was stink, my heart was nasty, my heart was filthy, and it's only Christ can clean up my heart. Only Jesus Christ dying on this cross. And being resurrected could have seen a change in my life. Because I will tell you, I will tell you one thing. God so loved the world that is give his only son to die for our sins. This is a common, a common verse in scripture. Everybody probably knows it by heart. People who not who not even our Christians know this by heart. But do we really know the meaning of this? Do we really know what Jesus Christ had done for us? Do we really know the pain and the suffering that took place on that cross for us? I was listening to an apologist. Many of you all would have known him, Ravi Zacharias. And I don't want to hear about the allegation. That was, I don't want to hear about that because at the end of the day, God used them for something and God used them for a purpose. And he mentioned something that there are four unchanging principles in the world today. Anywhere in the world, you would go, any hemisphere, any continent, any island. And the four of them are evil, justice, love, and forgiveness. The evil of the world we know about. The justice that God had to give his only son to die for us in, to serve that justice. The love that he loved us so much that he forgave our sins. All of these four things, because anywhere you go in the world, there is evil, there is a justice system, there is love, there is forgiveness. All of that four things converge on that cross that the Jesus was crucified. And the love that God has for us. Now, the thing with the, the this was written in Greek, the New Testament. And the Greek, the words for, that the Greek alphabet, the Greek language has, is so much as compared to the English language. The English language cannot, cannot begin to hold all the, the, the words that they have, the, 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 the letters. So we have one meaning for love in the English language. Whereas in the Greek language, there is many. And one of them is the highest form of love, and that is the agape love. And when I do look at the agape love, because that is the love that God has for us, God has for everybody, for Christians, for Hindus, for Muslims, for Buddhists, for everybody. He has that love, 
and you can experience that love if you surrender your life to him and repent. And the love that God has for us is unmotivated love. He doesn't have to do it, but he does it. He loves us to the highest, unconditional love. No husband can give you that love. No wife can give you that love. No father can give you that love in your world. In the, in the world. No mother can give you that love. No friend, no family, no boss, no co-worker can give you that love. Only Jesus can give you that love. The agape love. And the thing is, Jesus not only shared this love because the Jews rejected him, eh? but he showed that the love was not only for the love was not only for people in Jerusalem or Galilee or his people. He showed that the love was for everybody. In the first chapter of John, you will see what I'm talking about. The first chapter of John, chapter 1, verses 11. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. His own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, to all who did receive him, everybody on, this, on the face of the earth, black, blue, brown, white, pink, everybody, who believe in his name and give the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, no matter what bloodline you come from, nor of the will of flesh or the will of man, not what man give you, not what man see you as, but of God. You will all be children to God, no matter where you come from, no matter where you live, no matter what is your last name, no matter if your father has money, no matter if your teacher likes you, no matter if your teacher don't like you, no matter if you think you're ugly, because nobody is ugly, no matter if you're looking a certain way, no matter if your own family don't like you, you are a child of God. So, to all those who are joining in today, all those who are here and hearing the word, Jesus loves you. And not just love like you would love doubles <coughs> or food, a certain type of food. You love your friend. You love this movie. The highest form of love, Jesus loves you. I could stand up here today and show you and reveal to you all the things that Jesus has done for my life. Because that day when I saw my father, even though I saw a dying man, a man who was broken, a man who was in a, on his deathbed, a man who was looking so thin and so weak, and that is when it hit me how much Jesus loved me. I, I, I had a picture of him, and I look at a picture of myself today with my family, and I saw the physical revelation of what God did in my life. Because even though I had a, I, my biological father, I did not knew him. Even though my stepfather, who took the mantle and took care of me, even he had his addictions of alcoholism. And he deli God delivered me from that also. I could have been an alcoholic also. I could have been mistreating my wife. And God delivered me from that. And it had so many things that beliefs that I had that he delivered me from. Because sometimes my opinions 
the opinions that others may have. As I said before, you may idolize such opinions because the Bible said, do not create idols before you do not worship idols. Sometimes you could create an idol of your own idea, of your own opinion. And that in itself is a sin. So, I am calling you all today to not just believe in the Bible because the Bible is truth. The Bible is the living word. The Bible is what pierces our heart with a two-edged sword. A two-edged sword is not like a normal cutlass. It has two edges. You can't hold it back. If you try to hold a two-edged sword from hitting it in the heart, it will cut your hand. So that's how critical and that's how important and that's how effective the word is. Read the word and understand what I'm talking about. Experience that love. Experience what he did for you. Experience the gruesome and tortured death that Christ had to serve, had to, had to experience for our sins. Because Jesus could have just, I always wondered why it is God didn't just let a Roman guard just stab Jesus in the heart and dies it. No pain. Why Jesus had to go through such gruesome accounts and gruesome things before his, uh, his own yielding of his spirit. Why? Because he had to do it. That is how, that is the level of sin that we, we have. That is the level of sin that we do on a daily basis to God. And we humiliate him on a daily basis. We deny him on a daily basis. So, I just want to show you the physical testimony to what love, what true love is, what the agape love of God is. And it's something that if anyone think they are being rejected, you feel you're being rejected, you know you're being rejected, you're feeling hurt, you're feeling broken, you're feeling this, the world shattering around you. Everything, you're drunk in. You're drunk in bills. You're drunk in, you're drunk in family issues. You're drunk in relationships. You're drunk in something. If you feeling that way, know that God has your back and he will never turn his back on you. He would never do it because he never did it to me. Even though we may think that he has done it, but he has not. He just given you the opportunity to answer that call, to give him that drink of water. Give him that drink of water. Surrender your life unto him. Repent of your sins. Repent of your sins. And accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And pick up the cross and follow him. Because the cross wasn't something that was light. Like we had seen the, the rosary where the Catholics have. It's not something that, that looking pretty and varnished and smooth. The cross is something with rough edges. It's heavy. So it's not something, it's not an easy task. So, but it worth it in the end. Picking up that cross and following Jesus is worth it in the end. But let me tell you something, this life is temporary. This life that we are living here is for a short period of time. If you want to have an eternal life and experience the love that everyone around you cannot show you, surrender to him. If somebody wants in the life, who somebody who is viewing in, wants to experience this love and want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I just want you to come before him and just repeat this prayer after me. Think about it. You have an opportunity to experience that love, that love that you wasn't getting from nowhere, from no person. You can't, you can't get that love from your job. You cannot get that love from your bank account. You cannot get that, job, that love from money. You cannot get that love from marijuana. You cannot get that love from alcohol. You cannot get that love from 
anyone around you. Only Jesus can give you that love. Repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I come before you today, O Lord. I surrender my life unto you, Almighty God. Father God, thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to die for my sins. I repent, O Lord. Father God, I may not have a relationship with you, Almighty God. I do not know, I do not know your Son, Almighty God. I want to have a relationship with him, Almighty God. Father God, help me. Father God, I repent, Almighty God. I can only live with you, O Father. I cannot live without you, O Father. I tried living without you, O God, but it did not work out, O Father. Everyone seems to be letting me down. Father God, I'm a slave to the sin still, Almighty God. But only through you, Almighty God, you can deliver me. You can deliver me from the curses of my life. You can deliver me from the hurt. You can deliver me from the idolizing opinions, Almighty God. You can deliver me from everything, Almighty God, through your Son, Jesus Christ. Father God, I accept you, Almighty God. I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I will repent, Almighty God. I repent for my sins, Almighty God. And I will take, the, take up the cross, even though it may be heavy, Almighty God. Even though it may be rough around the edges. It may be, may be no... It is hurting me, Almighty oh, God. I will take it up and follow you, Almighty oh, God. Father God, I will answer that call to give you that water, drink of water so that I may experience living water, Almighty oh, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This is a call for not only Christians. It is a call for everybody. Whatever you think, you believe, Believe in Christ, because he is the only way out. I just want to thank God for giving me the opportunity to come here today to share the word to you. Because it's the word that will save you, is knowing that relationship, is knowing that love and experiencing that love. I just want to thank you for joining me today, but also... The, if you wish to contribute to Dunamis Embassy, there is a account number you can send your funds to Covenant Partners. Your various account numbers will be in the Faith Life group. And I just want you all to have a good day today. And think about what was said. Because it came from God, it came from Jesus, it came from the Holy Spirit. Thank you for joining in. Amen.